Today on Locked On Canadians, we start our draft preview coverage with a very special guest. Your Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Don Canadians. I think it's episode 561. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And today, we're going to start looking ahead to the draft. We've been promising this for a very, very long time. And we have our first special guest, who we hope will join us again in the future. But first, let me introduce myself and my co host. My name is Laura Saba, also known as the Active Stick. And I'm joined by Scott Matla of Habs Eyes on the Prize. Scott, how excited are you for today's episode? I am very excited because it allows me to stop pretending that I'm the prospect expert and talk to an actual <laughs> prospect expert for this. I just play one on TV slash YouTube when people ask us questions. Uh, I am very excited to kind of get taken to school on what we're doing here today. <laughs> and to take us to school is everyone's favorite ball draft analyst uh, for <laughs> Hockey News and Sports Illustrated, Tony Ferrari. Hi, how are you? And thank you so much for joining us. I am happy to be here, and as the favorite ball draft analyst, I have to wear my hat because I can't let the shine come on and, and blur. <laughs> <myself. laughs> um, so, Tony, we're so grateful to you for joining us because I know one thing that's been a really hot topic in Montreal is what happens if the Canadians don't get the first pick? Um, what happens if they get a pick that's somewhere high in the first round? And now, as, as the trade market has kind of opened up, the Canadians seem to be collecting picks in the first and second round, obviously. Um, um, and I think we should start maybe with a general uh, overview this week uh, about some of the names that are likely to go. So I guess, Scott, do we want to start with asking about Shane Wright, since that's the one everyone wants to hear about? I, I think that might be the play here, because one, about three weeks to a month ago, if you asked any Habs fan, everything, the light at the end of the tunnel was Shane Wright. And then Martin St. Louis and his gigantic quads came in and saved the Montreal Canadiens from utter destruction as they've won five in a row here, but they are still overcoming months of Dominique Ducharme's coaching, uh, an eight win in four and a half month span. So people want to know who is Shane Wright? What does Shane Wright do well? Because a lot of people without the world juniors this year, unfortunately really didn't get a chance to see uh, Shane Wright like they would have. They did get to see Connor Bedard, which is great. We'll get to that bridge next year if they're terrible again but people want to know who is Shane Wright you know playing in the OHL playing for Kingston right now he's an interesting player and in I think a lot of this draft class just kind of quickly going over a quick overview of the draft class in general this draft class is underwhelmed a little bit this year everyone was kind of expecting it to be two three steps ahead of last year's draft class which admittedly I think everyone was on board with it being a fairly underwhelming draft class in general but this year's draft class was supposed to be a little bit better. And I think the year off that a lot of players had, and even the players that didn't have a year off, they played 14, 15 games. A lot of the players really outside of the USHL and a few of the European leagues, they didn't really get more than 20 games. Even Shane Wright played a few games of the world under 18s and looked fantastic there. Absolutely fantastic. But he didn't play the rest of the year. So 18 months with 12 games of hockey at most, it's going to take a huge hit on a guy like Shane Wright or any prospect of that at this age. So I think, the offensive numbers that Shane Wright was putting up as a 15 year old in his, in his exceptional status season were on pace to break or, or match Connor McDavid. And the only player at 15 to do better than that was John Tavares. So you're looking at two guys who were extremely high end up uh, high end prospects and then ended up both going first overall and Shane Wright likely will go first overall himself. So what it was kind of happened with Shane Wright. And I think, like I said, that 18 months off, it really hampers development, especially at such a key stage. And between your 17, 18, 19 year old year, those are probably your biggest years of development as a, as a phys physicality and in terms of maturity as a player on the ice. So him losing out on a large chunk of that really sucks for him. But as Shane Wright is now, he's still a pretty dynamic offensive player. He gets this, this uh, tag as being this defensive stalwart. And I don't really think that's accurate. I think a lot of the people comparing him to Patrice Bergeron, that's really unfair to Shane Wright because while we look at Connor McDavid, Sidney Crosby, Austin Matthews, guys like that as generational talents, John, uh, uh, Patrice Bergeron is a generational talent in his own right on the defensive end of the game. I, I don't think there's ever been a forward that I've seen in my life that 
has had the defensive impact that sh- that Patrice Bergeron has. So putting Shane Wright in that category is kind of unfair to him as well because he went from being compared to John Tavares, Connor, uh, Connor McDavid, to now Patrice Bergeron. So they've just kind of shifted the goalposts a little bit, which, again, I still think is unfair. I, I, see, I do see a really high-end player, though, a Ryan O'Reilly type of player, a guy that can play good defensive game. But it's more making good reads and kind of being there for the outlet pass and not necessarily being the catalyst defensively, but being an excellent support player. And I think that's where Shane Wright really thrives in in the defensive end. Offensively, he's still got a really great shot. He's still got excellent vision. Kingston is a team. They're like, I'm not trying to be mean because they are doing really good in the standings, but like, they're not a team that you look at and you're like, oh, there's all this dynamic talent. Like, Martin Chromiak is a really good prospect, but like, He's, I, I remember in his draft year, I was like, this guy's a high end passenger. Like, it's not a guy that really catalyzes the ice. And, and Shane Wright is the guy that's leaned on to do that in a lot of the situations in Kingston. And he does do it, but he's got that, that development that's kind of stunted. And so you're seeing some ups and downs. And over the last month, he's been excellent. He, so he has picked up his scoring since the World Juniors. I mean, the two games of the World jun- Juniors, I guess. But overall, I think Shane Wright kind of suffered a little bit, especially at the start of the year, but he's picking it up lately and we're starting to see more and more of his offensive game come out. So I still have hope that he can get to that player. I think we're just going to see it a year or two later than we were originally kind of expecting it. And that doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world for the Montreal Canadiens who probably aren't in a big rush to take their first round pick this year and be like, you're fixing the franchise this year. Like a player like in 2023, not to get ahead of ourselves, but Connor Bedard, uh, seems like that dynamic talent that they could put in and maybe he is ready, maybe he's not, but just everything with Wright's vision and that it, like you said, he has the smarts part of it, the IQ of where to be, how to support his teammates, something that a lot of younger players tend to lack sometimes that, okay, but let's give him another year. Let's let him keep developing that game there. There isn't an immediate rush to get him to the show. And at the same time, the, the path that he's on, seems like the kind of player the Canadians need with Philip Deneau no longer with the organization and uh, Jesperi Kotkaniemi obviously go, leaving and an offer sheet. They need a kind of a guy who's very good in supporting and playing that Ryan O'Reilly role, someone who eventually will be able to eat up those big minutes in you know what assuming is going to be a top six center role in the NHL. Yeah, and I don't think there's any doubt that Shane Wright's going to be a top six center at the NHL level. It's just what level of top six center I think we're looking at. And if, if you get a guy that's Philip Deneau, but a lot better offensively, I don't think you're complaining. Like if you get a, a Ryan O'Reilly, like you're not complaining at the end of the day. So I, I think at the end of the day, you look at this guy and you're like, there's a lot to like here. And as you mentioned, like the Montreal Canadiens don't necessarily want to take a guy and put him in the NHL right away, make him play. I don't see a world where Shane Wright doesn't play in the NHL next year, but I would love to see him go back to junior for one more year just because he did miss that year of development. We see no one and we ha- we've never really seen it with a forward that goes first overall going back to his junior college system, but we've seen it last year with Owen Power who's a defenseman went back to Michigan. Eric Johnson back in 2006 went back to college as well. This isn't college, but I would love to see Shane Wright get that chance to go back the one year. I don't think we're going to see it, but I think it would do a lot for his development. And that's kind of the luxury that the Canadians have right now is that they they are in a little bit of a rush. I don't know if, um, you know, you've been paying attention lately, but they went from tear everything down to actually we're just doing a retooling because we want to sell seats. So there's a little bit of a, like they have to balance it out. So I feel like getting a guy like this, like they have a patience of maybe like the, the fans will give them like another year or so. They'll still fill seats if, if they're not winning all the games, but they're at least exciting on the ice. So I think like they do have that luxury, but in our next segment, what we're going to do is we're going to ask our esteemed guest about all of the other people that, not all of them, we're just going to, like, we don't have a lot of time to go in depth into everybody, but a couple of names that stand out to him in the top seven-ish area, and that's coming up in just one moment. But first, remember that Built Bar is one of our favorite sponsors because they're a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. They're so delicious, and they're so convenient. I use them as breakfast every day because I'm one of those people that just forgets to eat in the morning. They're high in protein, low in sugar. They're all delicious. They're made with real chocolate and they've got 18 delicious flavors, but they're always coming out with something special. Every week there's a new special edition flavor and they're all really, really good. So if you want to be like us and you want to try Built Bar, get your energy, whether it's for a hike, whether it's, you know, a mid-morning snack, a mid-afternoon snack, it'll really, really pick you up. Check out Built Bar. You can go to built.com and enter LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. That's built.com, 
and you enter LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. All right, so we've kind of covered a little bit uh, Shane Wright. And the thing about the Canadians is that right now, the way that they're trending, they're not necessarily going to finish much higher than 31st or 30th because everybody ahead of them is just too far ahead of them. Um, so they're kind of in that really good spot where they're probably going to finish, you know, with either the first overall or the second overall pick or sorry, spot in the lottery, which then could translate to the first overall pick, but they could also fall, right? So I think one of the things that's really important to look at is who are the other choices in that top five, top seven, because as you know, um, some some people will sometimes jump up a few spots and jump into that top three when you don't expect it. So I, I guess, Tony, to you, like, who, not even if you're the Canadians, like, if, if there's a player that you would really want or a couple of players that you would really want in those spots, who are you looking at right now at this point? There's still about half, a little less than half a season to go before the draft. I think the first two names I'll bring up really quickly is the two NTTB kids playing in Plymouth uh, with the U.S. under-18 program. That's Logan Cooley and Frank Nazar. Uh, I'm much higher on Frank Nazar than a lot of people are in the, in the draft. I think Frank Nazar is a guy that I think has all of the tools you want to be the best player in this draft. I think there is a legitimate chance that five, six, seven years from now, we're looking at Frank Nazar as the most productive, the most impactful, the most dynamic player to come out of this draft. And that's saying something because there's a lot of really high end skill in this draft. And I think that's what's really fun about this draft. And Frank Nazar brings incredible speed, incredible pace. Uh, his playmaking his in his pension for just getting to the middle of the ice and attacking play. And I think there there's things he needs to clean up. Some of his defensive consistency issues are, are, are there. He's really good positionally, I think, in the, in the defensive zone. Um, the other thing is he needs to figure out if he's a center or a winger, because if he's a winger, he can kind of lax a little bit defensively and, and really bring out some of those offensive tools dynamically in transition. But if he is a center, he's going to need to work on some of that defensive game, because while it's not bad, I think, He's in the right spot. I just don't know if he knows the next step all the time. And I think that's the big area that he needs to work on. But tools-wise, he might be one of the most impressive players in this draft. And then the foil to that is Logan Cooley, who I think he has above-average tools pretty much across the board. But it's it's that dynamic nature. And, and I feel bad saying that because I've seen so many highlights of him this year just dangling guys out of their jock straps and everything. But <laughs> He, it, it's, he doesn't have that same wow factor that Frank Nazar presents on almost every play. I think Logan Cooley is a much more projectable player, a guy that I think will play that two-way game. He's almost like a – he plays very much like Shane Wright, I think. He's a, it's like almost like a B-plus version of Shane Wright. And I think there's – I know there's some people that have him at first on their board, and I think that's personally a little bit much. But I think Logan Cooley is a guy that could be in that number two, three conversation because of all the projectability to his game. He does have that incredible offensive game where he just finds ways to produce, whether he's in front of the net, out in, in traffic, he's kind of patrolling the slot or on the half wall. He's able to make something happen no matter where he is on the ice. And I, th I really I think that's valuable and could fit really well with the Canadians. And I do think he's a center at the next level. I don't think there's really a worry about him going off to the wing. So that's another just asset to kind of put him above Nazar just a little bit. But like I said, the, the ceiling with Nazar is a little bit higher, but Cooley's a little bit more projectable. It's a fun debate between those two. And I, I like to get on the Nazar side just because I, I generally kind of lean a little bit more towards upside. And I do think there's a little bit more upside with Nazar there. I My follow-up to that is because, one, I love Frank Nazar. Uh, our scouting person at Eyes on the Prize mentioned him, and then I looked into him a little bit, and I went, that looks like a lot of fun. And with the Canadians getting a ton of first round picks, there's a chance that, hey, maybe one of them is that. But we'll touch on that next segment is I got to ask because we just we just finished the Olympics and the Slovak team won a bronze medal. And part of that was Juraj Slavkovsky, who is now after that and winning the most valuable player award. If I have my info, if I remember correctly on that. Yep. He rocketed up a lot of people's boards. Simon Nemitz is up there. And then obviously the other, uh, the Czech defenseman, uh, David Yerachek, who obviously got hurt in the opening part of the failed World Juniors tournament here. It feels like it's a little bit of shiny new toy syndrome watching Slavkovsky come up the board here. Not that he doesn't have a really appealing profile to him. He's big. He's a powerful player. He has some offensive nose there. But it feels like it's very in the moment. And I don't, I think the worst thing the Canadians could do is draft based on a small sample size, especially if they're not picking first overall. There's a ton of players in that two through seven range that could fall there. I don't want to say it would be a bad pick, but it feels like it might be jumping the gun a little bit based on one person having a very 
uh, successful Olympic tournament so far compared to the rest of their season. Yeah, he's playing in Liga, which is not an easy league for a teenager, but it just feels like it's jumping the gun a little bit to anoint them as they could be a potential number one pick. And I've seen them as a number one on some people's boards. And I go, this is you're uh, you're swaying to recency bias a little bit. And I think I'm, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like that's uh, kind of what's happening right now a little bit. I don't think you're wrong at all. I think I, I went into the Olympics and I even wrote about it a little bit on, on hockey news is I was like, Simo Nemec is the guy that I think is going to pop off and, and really kind of rise up boards. And it ended up being his teammate, Yaros Slikovsky, like you mentioned, and he won the MVP. He led the tournament in goals. He was scoring out, out the lights out. And at one point, I think through his first four goals, he was the only Slovak player to score. So he had all four of their goals and it was, it, he had an impressive showing and, there's no doubt about the fact that he's a really, really high end player. And I think he was, for me, he was a guy that was inside the top 10 kind of all season long. So seeing him kind of squeak into the top 10 on a lot of people's lists, and like, like you mentioned, kind of get up to that one, two, three spot on a lot of lists. I do think it's a recency bias thing. I think when you look at his league of tape, there are some things that he needs to work out. Um, but at the end of the day, he, and the crazy thing to me is when I watch him in the league and when I watch him in junior hockey and even at the world juniors and different, different tournaments that he's been at, I'm like, oh, this is a really high end playmaker. This is a guy that I think can be a really skilled passer, a guy that feathers passes through the slot and into the high danger areas with high precision and, and does it while protecting the puck, does it while, like you said, using that big frame. So when he came to the world or the, the Olympics, sorry, and he was just scoring the lights out and not making any passes, basically, it was like, oh, OK, <laughs> like there's a goal scoring upside, too. So while I think there there is some recency bias, I think people shooting up his board, shooting him up the board like they have been is a little bit much. I do think it. it kind of gave you that little element of, oh, there's some goal scoring there that he hasn't been able to show off at the league level. And now that the Olympics is over and everything's gone back and everyone's playing league games, I, I've been trying to watch for that goal scoring touch a little bit more at the league level. And it, it's still not quite there. I, I, I don't know if it's just a comfortability thing, a thing where he was getting more opportunities. He was told, hey, you're the guy here on the Slovak team. Like, score some goals for us and make make it known that you deserve to be in the top six. And he was able to do that there. And again, when you're playing in the Liga against men in a pro league, it's tough to sometimes get your footing. It's tough to get consistent minutes. A guy like Brad Lambert, Joachim Kamel have both dealt with that at times this year. So I think Slikovsky is a really high-end player. But yeah, I do think there's some recency bias. But if, say, the Canadians end up getting another I don't know how they would do this, but another top 10 pick and it's somewhere around five to 10. I don't think it's a bad pick to take them there. And so we're going to talk a little bit about, I mean, it's unlikely that they will get another top 10 pick unless they give up something really, really good, which um, I don't, don't, don't get rid of the players I want. I, I like, <laughs> uh, but the Canadians are likely to be collecting more picks and they've already got two well they're, they're going to give one away but they've already got one that's good, that's projected to go mid to late 20s so we're going to talk a little bit about later in the first round and what tony thinks might be a good uh, or a couple of names that he has his eye on and that's coming up in just one moment but first bet online football might be over for the season but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops from all the latest odds totals player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land betonline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs bet online remains the best spot for all your sports scores podcasts and news this season and it's not just basketball bet online is your source for hockey boxing and ufc odds as well head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action bet online where the game starts. All right. This episode is going by much faster than I wanted it to. I have so many questions, but we're going to narrow it down and hopefully, Tony, you will come back. Um, so the Canadians already have Calgary's pick, which is likely to go mid to late 20s. Uh, Calgary is our playoff team, the official locked on Canadians playoff team for this season. Um, and I think it was like, yeah, I feel like we have a pretty good relationship with the Flames right now. Um, and, uh, and, and and so obviously they have the number one pick and uh, it looks like they're trying to stock up in a couple more, maybe in the high second round or in the late first round. So I was thinking... Maybe Tony will ask you later in the, in the, in that you know that twenty to thirty range in that first round. Do you have any names that jump out to you that uh, you think that Canadians fans should keep an eye on? Well, first off, I am absolutely blown away that you're not supporting the Leafs in the playoffs this year. 
if, hold, such hold a on. good relationship between well, okay you and your fan hold on hold on hold on hold on i had to suffer through watching the packers and the bills in the playoffs this year the last thing i'm gonna do is adopt another team that's just gonna break my heart in the playoffs when i'm trying to cheer for them i will only cheer for the leafs and this is if this happens if they give us ben Sherratt, and then i will cheer for them to push it to seven games in the first round and then do what they normally do. So our picks as good as it could possibly ever be. So I think that's fair, but uh, let's not make that trade. Um, I'm just going to skip <laughs> over that one, but as for a couple names later in the first round, we'll just move on to that. Cause I don't want to talk about Ben Sherrod at all. Um, no, uh, the first name I'll bring up is Cali Odelia. So he's a def- left-handed defenseman from your garden uh, plays in Sweden right now. It's kind of been up and down between the junior and the, the men's team. But he's a, he's a really skilled player. He's just a, a, an incredibly talented skater. He's got decent size. He's not a guy that's going to necessarily blow anyone over. But he, he has the ability to kind of make people look silly a little bit. Um, I, I, I don't want to say Eric Carlson because that's completely unfair. But maybe a John Klingberg, Rasmus Sandin, a young player in Toronto, um, where they, they have the ability to kind of not necessarily make those flashy dangle moves. But you're, you're looking at a guy who f- somehow finds a way to – avoid two defenders coming in on him off the blue line and, and make a play into space or get himself in the space. And Kelly Adelius does it really, really well. He has good movement in all three zones. Uh, defensively, he's really smart. He's not, like I said, he's not the physical guy who's going to go up and blow anybody up. He doesn't necessarily shy away from the physical game. He works decently along the walls, but it's his stick work that, that really makes a difference there. He's in stick work and anticipation. He gets into passing lanes really well. Uh, just a really smart, skilled player that kind of plays that modern-day defensive game where you're looking at getting the puck back and moving it up the ice, whether with your own feet or with an excellent breakout pass, two things he's both capable of doing. And he's a guy that I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves for me he's inside of my top 20 but i almost fully expect him to be drafted around 25 to 35 i've seen him on a few lists outside of the top 50 even so it's like i don't know why but like almost everyone i respect in the in the prospect game has him inside the top of the first round so it's like that's kind of where i expect him to go that's where he's done a lot of the bigger lists as well so i think cali Adelis is a guy to keep an eye on and then he's got the the year garden teammates i think liam ogren uh uh, Noah Ausland and, and Jonathan Lekermacki are all three high-end forwards that I think could go as well. But the other player I'll give you real quick before we kind of move on to anyone else is uh, Pavel Mintyukov, who's uh, playing in the, in the OHL, Sarnia defenseman. Um, on my rankings, I jokingly listed him as a left winger and a left-handed defenseman because this guy just <laughs> doesn't have a position, basically. He plays on defense, but you see him going free reign all the time. He just loves to kind of go off and make a masterpiece in the offensive zone. He'll be like, there have been times where I've seen him as the first four checker. It's really, he plays a really weird game, but he has all of the tools. And and when you watch him, a lot of times I've gone, it's taken me a while to kind of warm up to him because I'm watching this guy go into the offensive zone as the first four checker. And I'm like, well, he's just completely leaving his defensive assignment. Like what the hell are you doing, man? Like, and then he's also the first guy back on defense. Like he has the skating ability to get back. He has the the mindset to get back. And I do think he's going to need to rein it in. I think you look at this player a lot of times in junior hockey and you're like, man, like you've got the tools, but can you rein it in? Can you play a little bit smarter? Can you play the pro style game? Cause the junior stuff doesn't always work. And I think that's the, always a downfall with guys like that. But with Pavel, he's a guy that's moving up boards a lot. He's got that incredible offensive upside. It's you, you want to see him develop that defensive game a little bit more because you do worry about, are you going to have to pair him with a guy that's going to have to babysit a little bit? And, and honestly, with the way he's able to kind of make a difference in the transition, the breakout, um, in, in the offensive zone specifically, and it, he'd be a power play quarterback on almost any NHL team once he develops, I, I think he's worth taking because he has the tools to get to that defensive kind of game at at least an average level for a defenseman, but can he get there? And I think that's always the question, but he's a fun player, a guy that I think with a coach like Martin St. Louis, who who we kind of mentioned it, or he mentioned it in his initial press conference, he wants players that will make reads. He wants players that don't, don't necessarily have to fit into a system that can kind of free reign, run run the gamut on their own and, and understand where they need to be and, and make that read in the space. And Pavel's a perfect guy like that. That's why I also like a guy like Frank Nazar is, you give those high skill, high end, high end players the ability to kind of run their own game, and they're going to do it at a high level. It's when you put the, those kind of guys in a system and kind of pigeonhole them into what their role is going to be and what they have to do on, on a given play that they struggle. So I think a guy like Pavel, under a coach like Martin Saint Louis, at least what we've seen so far and what he said so far, would be a really, really interesting match. It's funny because that's actually who I was going to ask you about because I've seen a lot of his name mentioned that I'm like, okay. Let me watch a clip of this if I'm not watching, you know, Jan Meshack or whomever playing the OHL. And like you said, he's 
he's fun. He, he brings an excitement to the game and the Canadians blue line for so long was, Hey, here's some tall dudes who don't leave the net. And if they do, uh, it looks very painful and slow. So it's, He's a modern, you know, offensive defenseman. He's almost a rover like you would find in soccer, a sweeping yeah. wingback, which sounds like a lot of fun. I, I suppose my question on the opposite side of that, is there someone who, in terms of the risk reward, really kind of uh, is, is going to be a tough bet for a team, even late in the first round that, you know, maybe they're going to go higher than they should just because teams are looking for that big high end bet. And there's a chance it might not kind of come off. i trying to phrase that as diplomatically as possible. So yeah, no, I get it. You're asking me which guy is going to go too high because he's pretty much a sure bet and he's not, but he doesn't have a ton <laughs> of risk. So he, his upside isn't necessarily high, but his floor is kind of pretty high. And in the, the first guy that p- jumps into my mind is Tristan Leno of the, the QMJHL plays for Gatineau. Uh, he came back a little bit earlier from injury than I expected earlier this year. I think he was expected to be out until the new year and he came back in early November. Um, and the way I've described him is solid, if unspectacular, he really doesn't, bring a lot of excitement to the game. Like I almost like I'm going to say this is going to sound a little bit mean, but I have fallen asleep watching his like tape sometimes because <laughs> it's just, <laughs> he's not going to make a mistake necessarily, but he's never going to make the play. I want him to as a guy who does value that skilled offensive upside. The, the guy that pushes the pace, Leno is just going to get the puck, move it to the right guy and move on. Like he's very no nonsense kind of player. I, I don't think he's going to be a bad player by any means, but I look at him and I go, he's going to be on a second or third pair for the next 10 to 12 years and be a solid NHLer. Is that a guy that you want to take at the end of the first round? Or do you want to bet on a guy like Pavel Mentieka or, or a guy like Matthias Havlid? Like there, there's other guys I think I'd rather take the risk on because my mindset is always, if you take the guy that could be a first pairing defenseman or could be a high end number two, number three guy, and he doesn't make it there, well, then you're probably still going to end up with a number four, five, six guy. Whereas if you take a guy that's pretty much guaranteed to be a number four, five, six, odds are you're probably going to get a five or six. And and at the end of the day, how much is a third pairing defenseman worth? Like, are we really going to worry about that? Like I always talk to people when they're asking me about my mindset on the draft and everything. And I'm like, I don't want to draft a third line player. I don't want to draft a a fourth line player, a a third pairing defenseman. Like I can get that in free agency for fairly cheap. I can plug and play, find guys to fill those roles. I want to get the guy that's going to play in my top six or my top four and be an impact player. So my mindset is always to devalue the guys that I'm like, he's going to be a third pairing defenseman. I'm not going to have to worry about it unless I do have that, that second their third first round picks. If Montreal has three first round picks, for instance, and they go Matthew Savoy up near the top of the draft, who's a bit of a risk. Then they get grab Pavel at the early twenties and they're sitting there at, 27 and they're like you know what let's get a guy that we just kind of know is going to make it so we get something out of this first round <laughs> tristan leno is the perfect player for that if you have that second or third pick to kind of offset the risk of you take with the other players i i think that's where you find value in a guy like leno but if you only have one first round pick i'm probably going to avoid that guy and that's i think the, the the problem with the canadians this far has kind of been that is that very much they don't shoot for the moon uh, but it looks like this new management team and this new coach, they, they're they against the safety. They want dynamic. They want offensive. They want players that can play in a lot of roles. And they want they want those guys that can make reads, as you said, as you alluded to. Um, you know, that's kind of uh, Marty San Luis philosophy. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, and we're basically out of time because we wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, what you think they'll do based on uh, who's who's in their front office now. We wanted to ask you about uh, their new co-head of scouting and all of that. But what I think we'll do is we will invite you back and we will give our listeners an opportunity to send us questions in advance uh, because I like I enjoyed this episode. I knew it was going to be fun, but I enjoyed it even more than I thought. Um, and speaking of Matthew Savoy, you can check out our friends at Locked on Sharks. Uh, Tony did an in-depth interview interview on him and we'll hopefully have you back and have a little bit more in-depth stuff as well thank you so much for your time can you tell people no where problem. to find you and your work yeah you can find me on twitter at the tony ferrari uh yeah it's pretty simple to find me there and all my works at the hockey news and sports illustrated you can find it all there uh, i do some videos with with prospects where i interview them and then we go over game tape together and kind of break things down and it's really illuminating to kind of talk to a player and be like why did you mess up on this player? Why did you, like, what made, <laughs> what was the decision that went into making this, this offensive chance or generating this play? And it's fun to kind of get their mindset on it. So I, I recommend those videos whenever people ask about my work, but you can follow me on Twitter at the Tony Ferrari. I'm always tweeting about hockey or something dumb. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I will say though that I've learned a lot like out of uh, both myself and Scott Scott is obviously the person who's more interested in, in prospects and has more of an expertise uh, but there's definitely people like Tony that I follow you keep doing that stop selling yourself <laughs> um, there's definitely people like Tony that I follow that I learn a lot from and we're so grateful for his time and if you want to follow us on Twitter we are at LO underscore Canadians if you'd like to email us so we're locked on Canadians at gmail.com uh, you can find scott on twitter at scott matla you will find me at the act of stick thank you so much for listening and if you liked this podcast make your second listen of the day locked on fantasy hockey we'll talk to you tomorrow